All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome to the second session of the Yale School of the Environment's Ocean and Climate Conference. Thank you all so much for joining the Marine Carbon Solutions panel. My name is Tiffany Mayville, and I'm a second year Master of Environmental Management student here at YSE, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Today, I am joined by three incredible panelists who are here to share their expertise and insights on carbon solutions related to marine and coastal ecosystems. Before we jump in, I'd first like to thank the other YSE students who have worked to organize this conference and a special shout out to Ryan Clemens and Claudia Ochaka for their efforts to put this panel together. Please note this panel is being recorded and this recording as well as other panels and the keynotes will be available on our conference website afterwards. Our panelists will start some things off with introductions to their work then we will have a group discussion and finally an audience Q&A for the final 15 to 20 minutes. If you have questions for the panelists at any time, please be sure to type it into the Q&A chat feature at the bottom of your screen and we will answer them at the end. After this panel, the conference will conclude with a keynote talk from Kathy Jetnell Kitchener, a poet, climate activist and educator from the Marshall Islands. The Zoom link will be entered into the chat at the end of our panel and is also available in your registration. We would be remiss to have a conference on climates and ocean without talking about all things carbon, blue carbon, and climate mitigation through carbon solutions. And so here today, I am joined by three amazing panelists who are going to talk about just those things. So joining us today, we have John Verdon, Director of the Oceans and Climate Policy Program at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions and an alum of YSE. John's area of expertise includes assisting developing country governments to reform and strengthen governance of their ocean resources and particular, particularly their fisheries in order to help reduce poverty and enhance sustainability. His work has focused mostly on the fisheries, on fisheries governance reform in West Africa and Western Pacific tuna fisheries, as well as governance for the blue economy in the Caribbean, among others. Prior to joining Duke in early 2015, John worked for more than 10 years at the World Bank, most recently as acting program manager for the Global Partnership for Oceans, a coalition of more than 150 governments, companies, non-governmental organizations, foundations, and multilateral agencies. He advised the bank on oceans and fisheries governance and helped it increase its lending for sustainable oceans to more than $1 billion. John holds a doctorate in marine bio policy from the University of Delaware School of Marine Policy, a master's degree from YSE, then known as Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and a bachelor's degree in political science from Wake Forest University. Also joining us is Kendall Barbary, who is Programs Director for Greenwave and also a YSE alum. At Greenwave, Kendall oversees the organization's training and support and innovation program, which are aimed at bringing new technologies to regenerative oceans farming, grow, farmers growing seaweed and shellfish, and helping farmers, hatchery technicians, and entrepreneurs build the skills and networks they need to be successful. Kendall attributes her passion for regenerative ocean farming to her childhood on the shores of the Mojek Bay in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and nearly 10 years of combined experience working on charter, commercial fishing, and research boats in Alaska and Antarctica. Prior to joining GreenWave, Kendall managed green infrastructure design and implementation project with partners in Connecticut and New York, helping to mitigate nutrient and bacteria pollution in the Long Island Sound. Kendall earned a Master of Environmental Science from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, now YSE, where she studied social ecology and water resource management. And finally, we are joined by Michael Alderson, co-founder and director of EcoSwale. Michael is a 2018 winner of the Pride of Newcastle Alumni Achievement Award for International Impact and was selected as a 2019 America's representative and global finalist in the category of social impact of the British Council's Alumni Award. He has six years of experience working in the private sector in the UK, focusing on sustainable development with an emphasis on international sustainability standards and has seven years of experience working in the nonprofit sector in the global south. He's conducted projects in the UK, Peru, the EU, West and East Africa, the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Since forming EcoSwell, his work has focused on implementing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals with a hands-on approach in vulnerable Peruvian communities through nature conservation, renewable energy, water, and sanitation initiatives. 
Michael holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Sciences and a Master of Science in Environmental Engineering from Newcastle University. So now let's go ahead and kick things off to our three panelists. And to start that, I'll turn things over to John. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany. And good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are, evening. It's a pleasure to get to speak with you all right now. And it's wonderful to reconnect with Yale um, and YSE. I'd love to get back there in person. It's, it's been far too long, but really happy to, to connect with everyone and to be with you today. Um, I'm just gonna start briefly by talking about one of the marine natural climate solutions that you mentioned, Tiffany, that's of course gotten a lot of attention is blue carbon. And particularly, I think as, as most here probably know and, and, and better than I, you know, blue carbon is a term that, that's come to embody or, or was coined about a decade ago to, to cover coastal vegetated ecosystems and their ability to se sequester and, and store carbon at a really high rates relative to other systems and, and to be very effective in carbon sequestration. And there were a number of studies that, that came out on this uh, around 2010, 2011, 2012, gained a lot of attention. And for those of us, uh, I, I came at this as a practitioner. So I was working at the World Bank at the time. We were supporting a lot of uh, governments to think about marine conservation, resource management. And so for those of us practicing at the time, this was a, a really exciting development thinking, okay, wow, if we can start to better quantify this ecosystem service that say mangrove ecosystems, coastal wetlands, seagrasses provide, to the global community, to local communities. And if markets are emerging for those, then maybe there's more funding that can be secured to cover the costs of conservation of these ecosystems and habitats. And so there was this basic thesis that it, depending on what these emerging carbon markets are around the globe at the time could pay for carbon, you might actually be able to fund conservation of say the world's uh, mangrove forests and, and to sort of arrest the, the trends in, in mangrove deforestation at the time. So that was the, the thesis that was developing um, almost a decade ago, particularly in the ocean conservation community, um, a number of governments, a lot of excitement. And I guess I had a, an interesting experience then trying to apply it in West Africa. And I thought it'd be useful just to share that case with everyone really briefly, because I think it was instructive in both the the potential of securing carbon finance to encourage conservation of blue carbon habitats and ecosystems, but also some of the, the pitfalls along the way. So I'll just, I'll share my screen with everyone really quickly here, just so, so that people can see um, if I can, let me find it down here. I'll show everyone a map of Guinea-Bissau so you can see where we tried to do this. Um, Essentially, what we were looking at at the time was could blue carbon uh, be a source of capital for conservation of some of the parks and protected areas in Guinea-Bissau in West Africa. So Guinea-Bissau, just so everyone knows, this is a country of just under 2 million people uh, on the northwest African coast, just below Senegal, for, for those who haven't been there. And it's a country that's dominated by the coastal zone. It has a lot of rivers and estuaries, a lot of coastal zone area considered as coastal zone. And it's, a, it's one of the few countries in West Africa that still had a lot of intact natural habitats along the coast, uh, intact mangrove forests, um, a lot of coastal marine biodiversity that had not yet been lost to urbanization and development in the region. And the country really in the late 90s, early 2000s, put a huge premium on trying to conserve this biodiversity before it was lost. And so the country created a, a national parks and protected areas system with five parks along the coast, one of which, which is highlighted at the top here in green, Cacheo National Park, just next to the border with Senegal, had about 70,000 hectares of intact mangrove forests in it. So we came at this from Having, uh, when I was at the World Bank and, and working with a number of other groups, IUCN, uh, MAVA Foundation in Switzerland, we were supporting the government and communities at the time to set up this parks and protected areas system and try to make it sustainable with a conservation endowment because the, the government was 
chronically underfunded, um, even with selling, for example, fishing licenses to foreign fleets to fund government operations. The government just did not have the money to fund the parks and protected areas system. So that's where we thought at the time, hey, this, this emerging science on blue carbon, the development of these carbon markets is something that's really exciting potentially for um, for Guinea-Bissau because it might offer us a solution to help sell the, the carbon, this ecosystem service, to increase funds in this conservation fund. The estimate was that the country needed about 20 million in this conservation endowment to fund the parks and protected areas in perpetuity. So in 2012, we secured some extra funding to try and measure the carbon that was stored in Cacheo National Park in these, in these uh, 70,000 hectares of mangroves to measure how much would be lost if the parks went away uh, without the funding to see the difference, to say essentially the park is conserving this much carbon storage because it's there. Without the park, you lose, you have this much emissions. These are emissions that you have avoided through funding this national park. And so that took quite a long time in, in that context. The, the Park Service worked with a um, consulting firm that we hired. Um, they basically did transects on the ground to verify what remote sensing and maps were telling them about deforestation rates, about carbon storage rates. And then based on that, developed uh, a reasonable project document saying, hey, this is the amount of emissions that were avoided. The markets were still nascent at the time. There was a biocarbon fund at the World Bank that was looking to seed these types of projects around the world with public money. So we took the project there. Long story short, they felt that any project in a country uh, like Guinea-Bissau that was politically unstable was too risky. They didn't fund it. And the government and, and those of us working with them were left to the voluntary markets as an alternative. That took another couple of years to develop, to do the homework, to get a project certified to a verifiable carbon standard, the VCS standard for voluntary markets. That happened in 2016. And then we were left with this question that none of us knew how to just go out and sell blue carbon credits. Um, the Parks and Protected Areas Service in Bissau didn't know where to start. I didn't know where to start. Uh, none of my colleagues did as well. And it's a languished a bit. Uh, the Conservation Endowment has gotten aid, grant funding from the World Bank and others to get started. It doesn't have enough, but the Park Service has kept on going. Um, and they're still looking to sell this, this significant store of blue carbon credits they have. This would be the world's largest blue carbon project um, with about, I, th I think, estimated close to 16 million tons of uh, emissions avoided over a 20 year period, um, several million dollars worth of, of credits that they were, they were hoping to sell to booster the, the conservation endowment to, to support the parks. We, it still hasn't happened yet. Um, now that I'm at Duke, I've sort of convinced the university to buy some of Guinea-Bissau's blue carbon. Uh, we're about to do that, uh, but it's a small amount. The university is not looking to buy huge amounts, but the, hopefully that all of the due diligence that's gone into that serves as a signal and incentive for others to do that. And we're you know, sort of, we're still optimistic, but thinking a little bit realistically about what can be achieved with blue carbon finance and, and, you know, the prospects at least of the carbon markets to support this marine natural climate solution. So I'll stop, I'll stop there uh, with my ramble, but I'm, I am optimistic for, as the science of blue carbon has continued to uh, expand and strengthen, I'm optimistic for uh, carbon serve, storage sequestration service as an incentive for conservation and even restoration of a lot of these coastal vegetated ecosystems. I'm just, um, I wouldn't say, I'm, I'm somewhat more uh, chastened or eyes wide open, I suppose, on the ability of the carbon markets to fund them. I think we need, we still need some work there before we're gonna have a portfolio of these projects because it just hasn't, 
you can still count now almost a decade later on one hand how many major blue carbon transactions have happened around the world at least to my knowledge so anyway that's just one experience uh, from out there trying to leverage at least the carbon markets to support blue carbon conservation. Great. Thank you so much for that, John. And, you know, as a person who worked in carbon offset verifications for many years, I always enjoy hearing a little bit on the project side, even if even struggles. <laughs> but so thanks so much for sharing. Um, and remember, uh, audience, if you do have any questions, um, please make sure to type uh, all your questions into the Q&A chat feature, and we will be sure to answer them at the end. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Kendall. Thank you so much, uh, Tiffany, Claudia, and Ryan, and all the presenters. It's humbling to be here with such distinguished panelists. Um, I am going to pull up a presentation for you. So give me one moment while I cue that. Tiffany, could you confirm that you see my presentation loud and yes. clear? Yes. All right, thank you so much. Um, as Tiffany mentioned, I'm Kendall Barbary. I'm a YSE alum and programs director for GreenWave. We are, we are a bi-coastal nonprofit organization based in New Haven, Connecticut on Quinnipiac land that trains and supports regenerative ocean farmers in the era of climate change. Regenerative ocean farmers grow a mix of seaweed and shellfish that requires zero inputs. In other words, a type of ocean polyculture that doesn't require fertilizers, feed, or fresh water. At GreenWave, our programming is centered on training and supporting ocean farmers and ocean entrepreneurs. We are also farmers ourselves. Um, we grow sugar kelp seed in our hatchery in Fairhaven and grow a mix of sugar kelp and Eastern oysters and blue mussels on our farm in the Thimble Islands in Branford, Connecticut. We also use our farm as a model for teaching fishermen, land-based farmers and coastal communities about alternative livelihoods and aim to provide the tools and skills that are necessary for creating a sustainable, low impact farm that produces high yields on a small footprint and provides healthful and delicious food while sequestering carbon and nitrogen, rebuilding marine ecosystems and creating jobs while preserving the ocean commons. Today, I'm going to hone in on how regenerative ocean farming can be used to combat climate change, as a tool to combat climate change, and share our vision for developing a carbon and nitrogen trading platform for ocean farmers with attention towards kelp, the sequoia of the sea. Kelp plays a central role in regulating the Earth's climate. A type of brown macroalgae, kelp is one of the fastest growing organisms on the planet. It takes up carbon at a rate five times faster than most land-based plants. Together with eelgrass marshes, mangroves, and other vegetation, they've sequestered nearly one third of human carbon emissions. A kelp farmer plants seed in the fall that's less than two millimeters long, and by late spring has a line covered in kelp that's 12 feet long or more. The rapid growth of kelp, as well as the rapid growth of the regenerative farming industry, projected at over 14% a year, has raised the process, prospect of leveraging ocean farms for carbon and nitrogen sequestration. For the last decade, GreenWave has been working with a global network of allies to probe the viability of the ocean farming, of ocean farming mitigation strategies. Annually, a 20 acre regenerative ocean farm may produce over 100,000 pounds of kelp, produce more than 200,000 uh, 200, pounds of shellfish and net more than $100,000 in profit. Farming seaweed in just 0.1% of the world's oceans can absorb 135 million tons of carbon and 10 million tons of nitrogen annually. By some accounts, growing seaweed in under 4% of California's coastal waters where natural kelp beds are in decline due to overharvest, urchin predation and other causes could completely neutralize California's agricultural emissions. But what happens to the kelp once it's absorbed, once the carbon is absorbed, and where the kelp goes after it's harvested determines whether it's sequestered or immobilized or just recycled through the ecosystem. Existing proposals for sequestration are complex, costly, and speculative, relying on potential for sinking kelp into deep ocean trenches where carbon may remain inaccessible for hundreds or thousands or even millions of years, 
There may be long potential, long-term potential for this method, especially as the Department of Energy um, is investigating potential for offshore kelp cultivation for biofuels and other products. But we're focusing on the small to medium scale ocean farmer in the near coastal environment. And we're particularly interested in understanding how farms play a role in reducing carbon locally. To better understand these impacts, we've partnered with a team of leading scientists to collect and analyze water and tissue samples from kelp and shellfish farms distributed along the East Coast bioregion, including our farm, and in Alaska. The first phase of this research was completed in 2012, and we're working to re replicate trials using the University of Connecticut's Nutrient Extraction Toolkit and other tools to build the data set on farm level production and regional variation on kelp carbon content and carbon and nitrogen sequestration potential. Once our kelp is harvested, we utilize a whole leaf processing strategy, directing portions of the crop and uh, to food and consumer pack packaged goods, compost and fertilizer, and plastic alternative products. Depending on where the crop ends up, there's potential for um, both avoided carbon, so eating a kelp burger instead of a cheeseburger, or even eating kelp instead of kale, using compostable packaging made of seaweed and lieu of plastic containers, um, or replacing synthetic fertilizers on farms in Connecticut with kelp that's grown in Long Island Sound, um, as well as the potential for sequestration and, immobil and immobilization by bridging land and sea agriculture. When brought to land as fertilizer or compost, there's potential for seaweed carbon content to be sequestered in the soil while reducing the need for fossil fuel-based fertilizers. Climate impacts are further reduced when cattle, a major source of the greenhouse gas, gas methane, begin eating a small amount of seaweed, supplementing traditional feeds with just 1% of seaweed of some species has been shown to reduce methane output by nearly 60%. So seaweed farming is a growing sector globally and domestically. Though just a fraction of global production, seaweed farming has expanded in the past decade in the United States from just a few thousand pounds of production per year to over 400,000 pounds grown in 2019. And the industry is scaling rapidly. These farms have substantial potential to provide a new form of carbon offsetting in the oceans. There's still a lot of research that's needed, of course, to quantify the benefits and the impacts of this farming model on local and global carbon cycles. Measurable and accurate carbon and nitrogen mitigation requires data that's region specific, collected and analyzed from on-farm tissue sampling and tied to verifiable farm production yields. It's our vision to harness the leading scientific research and develop and pilot a blue carbon and nitrogen auction platform for regenerative ocean farmers based right here in Long Island Sound. Our strategy aims to bridge land and sea by leveraging land-based agriculture's soil sequestration process and protocols to generate a traceable carbon offset for farmers. Each season, a percentage of kelp grown by ocean farmers would be allocated as organic matter for soil amendments for land-based agriculture, urban tree planting projects, parks and university campuses. For each ton of kelp dedicated for a soil amendment, an ocean farmer would receive one offset. Institutional and individual consumers would then purchase the offsets from our yearly auction. Participating kelp farms and land-based end users would be certified by an independent third-party accounting firm. And carbon offset buyers would receive a verification report prepared and signed by the third-party certifiers. Right now, this is a vision. We're still doing lots of work. Um, and I, I know that seaweed farming is not a panacea for climate change, but it certainly provides an invaluable tool for a sustainable future. Thank you. Awesome, great. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Kendall. And yeah, it's so cool to hear about just some of the innovation happening and how we're just thinking more through the life cycle of carbon and where we can sequester and mitigate it. It's a very cool projects going on at GreenWave. All right, and then finally, we're gonna go ahead and kick it over to Michael Alderson uh, from EcoSwale. Hello there. Thank you very much, Tiffany. It's super inspiring and encouraging to hear about the amazing work that you guys are doing, John and Kendall. 
Um, and now I'm going to share my screen. All right. So please let me know if, if this works, Tiffany. Looks like we got something starting. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about the challenges of conserving blue carbon coastal ecosystems in high risk areas of the global south. In the background, you can see the beautiful Pacific Ocean. And in between, uh, right in front of, this, of the sand dunes, closer to us, it's one of the wetlands that we're looking to, to protect through our work. So you did a, a fantastic presentation of, of, of who I am. So I'm just going to skip this section, all right? That's just a little bit about, about me. And well, at Ecoswell, we believe that people and nature can and must thrive in unison. So we're a nonprofit operating in Peru, which since 2013 has been developing vulnerable coastal communities in Peru sustainably through the implementation of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We take a hand-on approach with this community. So we design the projects and we implement them with them. We take a bottom-up approach to development. In basic terms, we improve people's lives and protect our natural environment. How do we go about implementing the SDGs? Well, we start off with socioeconomic assessments. We take, a, as I mentioned, a bottom-up approach. So we'll carry out ethnographic studies, um, focus groups, interviews with local community leaders, with women separate from the men, then with the men and with the youth as well, all right? And through this process, we aim to identify what the gaps are in the communities to addressing the SDGs. And based on this, we'll design and implement our projects, okay? So that has led us to developing renewable energy initiatives, economic productivity projects for vulnerable communities, reforestation and nature conservation. I'm going to be talking uh, about that in, in this conference. Water and sanitation, public health, amongst others. And we carry out these projects, the design phase and implementation phase with researchers from top universities, with volunteer interns, professionals and students also from top universities, companies and the public sector. You can see some images there of, of the kind of work that we do. I'll be talking about our Piedritas Verde project. Okay, this is an applied conservation of blue carbon coastal ecosystems initiative. All right. So it's one of the 17 different initiatives uh, that we have developed over the years. This project started in 2017, all right? Piedritas is a town located in Peru's northern coast, all right? And it's located in one of the top three world biodiversity hotspots for bird species, according to BirdLife International, okay? So it's located in, a, in an amazing, amazing locality. Um, it's a town of 500 people. Unfortunately, three quarters of the population live in poverty and extreme poverty, okay? So that makes conservation efforts uh, a lot harder, a lot, a lot more urgent as well. The project seeks to stop the degradation of the local coastal equatorial dry forest. It's a bit of a mouthful, all right? Um, unfortunately, 90% of the equatorial dry forest has been degraded by man, making it one of the most endangered forests in the world and it's wetlands. We have wetlands right next to the equatorial dry forest, okay? And this project seeks to lift, seeks to lift people out of poverty through ecotourism, through bird watching, all right? So we basically need to enable the local uh, people to make money from protecting nature as opposed to through degrading it. Right now, they, uh, their main source of income is illegal logging, okay, of the dry forest. They don't enjoy taking part in this. They've told us that they do not want to um, take part in, in, in illegal logging, but they really have no, no choice. So we aim to present a, a choice that focuses on conserving nature through this project. So here you can see an image of Piedritas, all right? Piedritas is right next to the road where you see the eye um, legend. You can see some roots uh, on the left of that that we have already de developed. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse cursor. I'm just passing it over the route. Okay, great. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, these are some of the routes that we have already created and we've created this project with Enel Energy. So a private partner of ours, okay, that operates in, in the local region. The next phases of the project seek to protect wetlands number one, number two, number three, and eventually, hopefully also reaching wetland number four, okay? So you can see 
one great patch of equatorial dry forest here. All right, as I mentioned earlier, this forest has been degraded by 90%. Okay, so we're really working hard to protect this, this, this bit of the forest, all right? I must mention as well that we have a lot of endemic species in this forest. So if the forest goes, the species go with it. Endemic meaning bird species that just exist in this part of the world, so you won't find them anywhere else. Okay, so what are the challenges of carrying out a project like this? What are the challenges of our Piedritas Verde uh, Coastal Carbon Sink Conservation Project? All right. And why do I call it a high-risk area? Well, the Piedritas and the wetlands are located in an oil exploration concession of a Chinese company. Okay, this presents a barrier to securing the area as a formal conservation area because it puts off, it puts off Gover local government authorities from wanting to even consider protecting this area, all right? It, it's just an additional barrier for them having to think about, oh, well, there's an oil company there already, so maybe we shouldn't, you know, it's just more work for us. And the risk of oil exploration is present. So the oil company could decide to start drilling holes in the wetlands, you know, um, and they would, they would have to go through a certain process, but they do have the concession of the area, okay? There's a lack of awareness from local authorities, local government authorities, in terms of the ecosystem services that these wetlands and the equatorial forests can bring to the table, okay? Their importance in terms of climate change um, and ecosystem services that it can provide to the local community. There is really no interest from the local authority um, or they don't have any actionable um, policies on protecting these ecosystems. So it's up to us, Ecoswell, to change this, right? And there's a lot of informality in this part of the world. Um, I'm not talking about Peru in general. There are fantastic government entities in Peru that do an amazing work in protecting different ecosystems. Unfortunately, in the part where we are, that's not the case. And well, that's one of the reasons why we exist as an organization, because if no one else is doing it, then well, someone has to, right? So just to add to those factors, there is a lot of land grabbing, all right, where we are located. Okay, that means people basically take land and then they say it's theirs and then they invade it. Um, and that's a constant menace um, for the wetlands because someone could just decide, okay, this is, these wetlands are mine now, I'm gonna build a hotel on top of them. Um, people in the locality, in the locality of Piedritas, they don't have legal rights over their land. They've been trying to get it for decades, but the local government still won't give it to them, okay? So they cannot legally defend their wetlands. They cannot legally defend their forest. They have to confront land grabbers personally. So I just have a think about that, what that entails, okay? The state does not actively intervene in stopping this either. Again, the local municipalities of the region do not take much of an interest in this. So, well, it's up to us to, to do something about it. So how do you confront this this scenario, how do you save these wetlands? How do you protect, how do you conserve these endangered ecosystems? Well, you need to keep building a presence through project implementation. You need to create more activity centered around ecotourism. You need to build more infrastructure for tourists. Um, and this will serve as a barrier. It will dissuade land grabbers and the oil company from taking over this land. If they see people coming in to visit, if they see that a local community which three quarters of its population live in poverty or extreme poverty are earning an income through this ecotourism, they won't want to impact that. Oil companies do worry a lot about their, their um, image on media. Um, and it's also a lot of work and it's expensive for them to relocate people, right? And land grabbers, well, they don't care so much about that, but if they see that there are people there um, and there's a lot of activity, then they'll, it'll be a lot harder for them to grab that land, obviously, because there's, there would be more of a confrontation there. So you basically need to push forward conservation initiatives, right? You just need to be there and make sure that um, you're taking action. You need to ensure the financial sustainability of the ecotourism routes. This is a business. Local people who need the money um, will protect the natural environment if it makes the money, okay? They, People here live on a day-to-day -day basis. The money that they make on that day is the money that they'll spend that day for food for their family, okay? Um, if they're not earning an income through ecotourism, then they will resort back to illegal logging because that's what enables them to feed their families, all right? 
and you need to keep attracting the interest of local of the local authority and that's something that we have been doing unfortunately it took us three years to develop this project and only after the project implementation had finished and we we um we had built the project and this, the success of it was obvious um we had three uh, we've had 300 people um do the routes since we opened them in, in uh, 2019 without even promoting them only then did the local government take an interest in our project ideally local governments should take an interest before um anything happens they, it should be them really who who um protect their their natural ecosystems right so what are the lessons learned what do i want to share uh with you guys what what can you take home in relation to how to protect threatened carbon sinks in complicated areas of the global south so start if you're taking a bottom-up approach you need to start off with a socioeconomic assessment ethnographic studies you need to understand the community that you're working with okay you need to understand uh, what they've done in the past, what they haven't done. Um, this will enable you as well to design a, a really good project that will ensure the sustainability of, of it in the, in the long run, right? You need to understand that each locality is different as well, okay? And through these socioeconomic assessments, it's how you, you are able to understand this. You need to work with the local community. You need to make it financially viable for them. As I said earlier, they will be the stewards of this area. If you do not work with local people, um, the chances of your projects as in the long run are slim they will be ultimately the people who protect their ecosystem you need to establish partnerships we've been able to develop this project thanks to enel uh, one of our uh, partners a, a private company and um, if you're able to get the public sector that would be fantastic because then you could formally uh, uh, obtain a legal uh, protection for for this area right and that the state enabled this you can also gain traction and more funding by building more partnerships. You can get more done. Understand that there are many different underlying issues and there is no silver bullet to solving them. Okay. We have to deal with land grabbing. We have to deal with uh, oil exploration area. Um, you then deal with social conflict as well between the people that live in the, within the community. You deal with contamination and pollution. There's a wastewater treatment plant in the vicinity that has collapsed and wastewater um, is spilling out of it. Um, we have a great problem with solid waste management. There's rubbish in the vicinity as well. And you need to address these problems um, head on with experts. You need an interdisciplinary team as well. So you need social scientists, you need environmental engineers, you need biologists. Um, we will not have been able to do this project without Jeremy Flanagan, who is a uh, he, he runs an uh, SOS Cortarrama Peruana, uh, a local nonprofit, and he's been studying the bird species in the locality for the last few decades, living in, in, in the areas where we operate. Huh? Um, and you need to keep at it. It's not a project that takes a month, six months, a year. It's a project. It, it's an initiative that takes years. It's a it's a challenging path, but it's definitely a battle worth fighting. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Michael. That was great. Um, it's really good to hear about what's being done at such a local level and just all the great work that you all are doing down there. It's amazing. Thank you. Great, well, thanks so much to all of our panelists. Um, I definitely learned a lot and as a, you know, self-identified carbon nerd, I always enjoy hearing all these different perspectives and thoughts and like just kind of the innovation that's happening in the carbon sector. Um, so we're going to go ahead and kind of have, you know, open discussion, kind of open dialogue amongst us. Um, and, you know, I just want to, I guess, put a question out to all of you that some of you alluded a little bit in your chats, but I'd like to hear from you on this, um, you know, especially in the carbon world, talking about coastal and marine carbon solutions. A lot of times co-benefits and trade-offs um, are talked about and they're an important part of the conversation for any climate solutions. Um, but what are some of the key ones in kind of your area or what are ones that are often overlooked that we really should be hyping up um, as a way to kind of, you know, push for support for this kind of solution? Kendall, over to you. Yeah, I saw your hand up. So, <laughs> thanks, John, and please see the floor. Um, I mean, I think that there are some pretty straightforward co-benefits uh, with kelp and 
you know, regenerative ocean farming, especially. Um, uh, we talked a bit about um, carbon uptake and also nitrogen absorption, but there are other roles that these kelp farms are playing to enhance ecosystems, providing additional habitat. Um, farming is also uh, a source of income for the people who are doing the work. So job creation and habitat services and, um, and helping to address climate change. Yeah, from my perspective, just really quickly, I would just say mangroves, coastal wetlands, where we've been looking to support conservation and now increasingly restoration. Um, it's the tremendous co-benefits of coastal protection functions that many of these ecosystems play for communities and, and structures uh, behind them uh, to prevent, reduce flooding damages, as well as to sequester carbon. So in a sense, both mitigating and supporting mitigation and adaptation. Um, Quantifying that, doing economic valuation of those benefits has been really challenging. And there's been a lot of work on that over the years. It's certainly getting better, but uh, doing that at a, uh, quickly enough and at a level enough that can then translate into uh, marketing, the, going to markets and, and trying to monetize these services is tougher. But I think the recognition and the awareness of these multiple benefits that these ecosystems play I certainly have seen that grow among governments and at different levels around the world and increasing their interest in policies and investment, public investments, at least. I have to agree with everything that everyone's saying um, and the benefits as well of protecting wetlands. Um, well, they're super important in terms of, of addressing climate change. Uh, according to NOAA, um, wetlands are able to sequester 10 times more carbon than, than conventional forests. Um, the benefits of conserving wetlands as well, there's the biodiversity, as I mentioned, uh, their habitats to, to bird species from, from all over the world, um, including the US. Not a lot of the conservation initiatives that happen in the US benefit the bird species that actually fly all the way down to where we are um, when they are escaping the, the winter months and they uh, spend the, the, the warmer months uh, with us in Piedritas and in the surrounding environment, right? And yeah, the government is also taking more of an interest and they're taking more of an interest because of the money that could be made um, and because it could help people out, maybe not so much because of climate change uh, reasons, just because that isn't so well ingrained in them yet. And again, that's like a role for us to to um, to promote. Now we have a responsibility in, in helping uh, raise our awareness, but yeah. Great, thank you all, that was great. Um, and I guess, you know, it's as, you know, Michael, you've mentioned at the tail end, the importance of making sure that we highlight some of these co-benefits to kind of, get more interest in either financing or funding or just support in general, especially from governments, but also from other folks. Um, but there still has a lot of barriers, um, both institutional or just on the science side for understanding and quantifying and really measuring what are these benefits and also what even is carbon sequestration or carbon mitigation in these natural ecosystems. Um, and so my question to all three of you um, is, you know, how, what, how do we kind of get through some of these barriers or what are some of the key pieces that we need, whether it's policy or um, legislation or just like community support to start to overcome these barriers so we can see some more scalability in these solutions? Go ahead, Michael. All right, well, from working from um, a bottom-up approach, uh, that'll be different to, to a top-down approach. Um, we, um, and it also depends on the locality where you are, as a big factor for us is a lack of interest from the local government in, in terms of, of climate change adaptation. They have other um, priorities in their agenda. Um, and it also depends on the administration that you have at the time. So the previous administration was more interested in conservation and, and in climate change related topics. The current one isn't, and that becomes a, a big problem. You know, um, because that basically means that the that the local government won't be investing funds in in, in this direction. Um, so we have a responsibility to uh, raise awareness as much as possible, um, bring in more international partners to help work with us, 
get more companies to join us. Usually when you gain that kind of traction, then the local government really takes an interest when they see that companies are taking an interest in their locality, when they see, you know, Yale University talking about their locality, they're like, wow, wow, okay, there's something valuable here that maybe we should really consider protecting because it's attracting all of this international attention, right? And all of this action. So that's very important. And, and you just basically need to keep pushing in that direction. In terms of community, um, constant uh, engagement with the local community, workshops, uh, house to house visits, they are a lot more effective in, in, in reaching uh, people's, uh, reconvincing people about the importance of, of climate change and the importance of this ecosystem. Kendall, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I think, you know, there, there of course are barriers to people becoming regenerative ocean farmers. And some of that is tied to costs. Some is permitting um, accessing the space. While there is a lot of ocean out there, there may be uh, very kind of just defined areas where it's appropriate and possible to put a farm. Um, I think that increasingly people are, are also flocking to this industry, especially as in places like Maine, where lobstering is declining, people are looking for alternative livelihoods. And in Alaska, where warming waters and ocean acidification is impacting crabbing and other fisheries and um, uh, the, the lifestyle of the commercial fishermen, people are looking for alternatives. And so what we are trying to do at Green Wave is one, understand the science and communicate that science, um, and two, provide the training and support that's necessary to help people um, approach this in industry um, with the right principles and values and to build a sustainable business that is going to provide a livelihood and uh, you know, provide benefits for the environment at the same time. There are wrong ways to do it. Um, and one of those things like we you know, really wanna focus on regenerative species of shellfish and seaweed that are providing those dual benefits of, of jobs and uh, environmental benefits. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tiffany. I'm happy to add just, just really quickly to say that on the one hand, and I'm, I'm going to sound very old here, uh, but I'm, you know, I thought when blue carbon science emerged in 2010, I thought where we'd be now being uh, optimistic and perhaps naive was that we would have this global portfolio of blue carbon projects like green bonds uh, that would be supporting coastal conservation at a much greater scale because we'd be getting these services funded by these, these carbon markets. That's been slow to happen, and I've seen it in myself wrestling in Guinea-Bissau for years and years, and now we have our first sale as of this year, which is just a fraction of what we thought. That said, the amount of uh, research that has been going into this over the last 10 years that has expanded what we know and understand and, and what at least from, from my colleagues who uh, study the ecology of these ecosystems and, and looking at this, it's much greater than we knew then. Uh, we see companies, organizations popping up working on this. Green Wave is a great example uh, to see these, this type of effort coming through. And, and Michael as well, the, these, these efforts are proliferating, as is the science, as is the understanding. Um, it's, I feel like it's generating a momentum for attention to, to blue carbon amongst governments, amongst companies. Uh, talk to companies that want this kind of story with the carbon offsets that they're looking at that's behind it. So uh, I, I feel optimistic. It's maybe a little bit longer than I'd hoped, but certainly the attention, the understanding, the, the will and awareness, I feel like is growing um, in a lot of places around the world. The one plea I would put in, at least for blue carbon in the tropics in terms of barriers, is that we don't forget about the communities, for example, that, that Michael, that you're working with, the coastal fishing communities that so many of us work with, who are quite concerned and have said so uh, vocally and on the international stage that we are commodifying these ecosystems and turning them into just natural, these capital assets that can be sold and taken from them in that sense. And there's a, there's a real concern that, that these ecosystems that have 
a lot of use, meaning, value for these communities beyond just uh, some of these ecosystem services that we measure are going to be lost to them through this type of process and, and looking at payments for ecosystem services and markets. So there's a real concern, or to me, a priority that we all also don't lose focus on these communities at the heart of efforts on blue carbon. Absolutely. Well, thanks all. Yeah, definitely hearing about, you know, the need of supporting changes, the challenges of awareness and education, costs, red tape, financing, and how do we provide, you know, but the solutions of providing alternative livelihoods and adding all these co-benefits, I think are really important things to echo as well. So thank you all of you for that. So we're going to go ahead now and transition over to the some audience questions. Um, we've had a few come in, so thank you everyone. And if you do have a question that pops up, please remember to go ahead and drop it in the Q&A below. Um, so this is going to be a combo question directed first at you, Kendall. Um, so what percentage of kelp fixed carbon is net sequestered and how long is that sequestration? I don't know that I can fully answer that question. Um, as one, just full disclosure, um, you know, a background as a, as a fisherman, not as a climate scientist. However, um, what I can say and what I can speak to is, you know, that I think that there's great potential, especially in near coastal ecosystems for these regenerative ocean farms to play a role um, in addressing uh, carbon issues in our water as well as other um, nutrient problems. I, I think that part of the question um, and maybe what I saw in the chat box too is really specifically asking about the um, carbon cycle and actual sequestration that's occurring when uh, kelp is um, either harvested or detaches from its natural reef and moves into a deep ocean trench. Um, there's lots of, there's data that points to one that is a sort of a part of the natural kelp cycle for reefs all around the world. Um, but we don't yet fully understand the, the role and um, whether it would be feasible or beneficial to look at kelp farms in that way, um, to think of them as uh, you know, sequestering by moving the kelp into deep ocean trenches. You're not sequestering kelp just by taking it up into the tissue, um, but by removing it from the system. And so that deep ocean, open, open trench is like one potential pathway that a lot of scientists are investigating and looking into. And we're trying to understand, well, how can we remove it from the water. And so, um, you know, addressing the carbon cycle, but also looking locally at things like ocean acidification. Um, how can we remove it from the water, relocate it to land? And is there um, a process either in partnering with uh, agricultural partners or others to, um, to get the kelp into the soil in a way that it's not necessarily going to be tilled up and then released back into the atmosphere, but is, is bound in the soil and immobilized. That might be, you know, a time scale of tens to hundreds of years versus, you know, what um, scientists are looking at in the deep ocean where they're thinking that could be hundreds to millions of years. So the time scale is very, we're really uh, focused on um, doing that research, being an industry partner and using our farm and our network of farmers um, to help to better understand the role of these farms in their ecosystems and what's happening once that kelp is removed and taken to land um, and being able to develop a, a verifiable and traceable system to account for that. Thanks, Kendall. Yeah, lots of complexity in this, but it's all just so important to think of all the little pieces and how they fit together. <laughs> Carbon is such a big puzzle that we should kind of figure out how it all goes. <laughs> all right, great. We have another audience question. Um, I'll direct this first at Michael, but then can kind of open it up to all of you. So Michael, you did talk a little bit about this, but I think it's a really good uh, pinpointing, but um, how does your focus areas political climate impact blue carbon economic viability? Ooh, okay. Um, so we haven't reached that stage yet. We're looking at protecting um, these ecosystems. We're looking at ensuring that they are not degraded by, say, land grabbers, um, that they're not burned down by land grabbers, and hoping that through our action of building the ecotourism projects, that will dissuade also the oil companies from drilling their wells there. 
All right. So we're at that stage of the project. And then we aim obviously to bring eco to, uh, ecotourism into the fold, get people to spend money. And that way, the local community will be uh, gaining a, an income from this, as opposed to selling uh, cut down the tree illegally, right? Um, as charcoal. We'd love to consider then um, a blue carbon credits. Um, I've learned a lot from, from John. This has been super, super interesting to hear about his work. Um, and hopefully in a, in a, in a maybe not so, uh, in the near future, hopefully we, our project would be at a stage in which it could be considered for this, this kind of initiative. So we're at the very early stages. Um, so yeah, we, we wouldn't have an impact on, on, on the market right now. I hope that answered your question. Thanks to the audience for challenging questions. <laughs> All right, well, we do have one more, qu another question for Kendall. <laughs> There's lots of green wave questions. Um, so what cost estimates for seaweed cultivation does green wave use and which potential seaweed carbon actions do you find sequester uh, carbon cost effectively. Technical seaweed questions. Could you restate the question? Yeah, of course. Uh, what cost estimates for seaweed cultivation does Green Wave use? And which potential seaweed carbon actions do you find to sequester carbon cost effectively? Um, so what cost estimates do we use for seaweed cultivation? And I'm taking that as um, how are we, how are we determining how much it costs to start a farm? Is that the? Let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. So, uh, you know, we, we base our cost estimates, not only on how much it costs for us to farm in the Thimble Islands, but also by aggregating data from small to medium scale farmers that we work with throughout our network um, in Southern New England, in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. And um, costs are variable in many ways, um, especially kind of we've, we've just completed a, a national kind of coastal, a, a national analysis of coastal states to look at um, cost of leasing a site. So gaining access to a site, everyone's working in the public commons. You don't own the grounds that you're working on. You uh, earn the right to operate in these places and you get kind of permission temporarily um, and can renew that permission. And the, the cost of leasing varies widely. The cost of permitting and any um, uh, supporting documentation that, or, or research that you need to do before securing those permits also varies widely. Way too much nuance probably for right now, but what I can tell you is that um, given uh, a lease um, and uh, of about 20 acres, as well as some of the infrastructure that's necessary to farm, um, we find that it is uh, feasible to start an operation um, for under $20,000. Um, that also is going to vary on, on what infrastructure you have access to. I've forgotten the second part of the question. I apologize. It's okay, we can move on. Well, we're nearing the end here. So as my prerogative as a moderator, I'm gonna go ahead and ask the final question to the panel before I close out. Um, so it's talked a lot about some really great solutions and it wouldn't be a carbon solutions panel without talking about what are some next steps to support these kind of initiatives and how do we help it reach its full climate solutions potential? I'm happy to go last here, or Michael, Kendall, if you want to take the first crack. Kendall, you go ahead. Oh, go ahead, John, if you want. <laughs> OK, thank you very briefly. I'm, um, as I said, I'm actually quite optimistic that um, that the attention, the effort, the awareness of the different co-benefits of these coastal vegetate ecosystems is increasing, is expanding, research on this is growing, and that we will standardize tools more and more to make this easier for, for practitioners, make it easier for, say, for you, Michael, to be able to say, hey, let's, let's make this into a project that we can then take out there. So I'm, uh, it, it's taken longer than I thought, maybe a decade ago, but I'm, I'm quite optimistic. The other thing I'm really optimistic about 
is what my colleagues, um, Brian Silliman, others at the Marine Lab are telling me about where they feel like coastal restoration science is emerging and is going and that we are getting a lot better at uh, restoring coastal ecosystems and doing it to scale and that coastal and marine uh, restoration is catching up to, to where things are terrestrial. So, um, and you know, Kendall's farther, would be able to say far better than I. So I'm optimistic where I see restoration going. And I think, um, I don't think governments are going to be able to, uh, to avoid paying attention to that. I don't think reinsurance companies, insurance companies are gonna avoid being able to pay attention to the, the potential for, for restoration and, and conservation of these coastal ecosystems. I'm happy to, to answer now. Um, I, I agree with, with John. I'm, I'm positive about the future. Um, I, I also agree that we need more research. There is so much research to be done where we operate. For example, there are so many unknowns. Um, and I know it's the same for many other parts in Peru in, in relation to, to, for example, the wetlands that, that exist in the coast. Um, so more of that would be amazing. And that's sort of the approach that we're, that we're taking as an organization. We're constantly building new partnerships with, with universities who, who work in, in this field. And um, that's, that's how you make change happen, right? You, you learn from, from each other. Um, you're able to have much more of an impact in that manner. Um, and at the same time, also, um, and I'm going to be, I'm going to sound a bit biased here, but um, funding for organizations doing the groundwork, right? Without the people in the groundwork, then you can't identify these areas. Um, you can't help conserve them and protect them. And you can't fund all of the work that say right now, a local government isn't willing, willing to fund. Um, we've been very lucky that the private company Enel that is there, um, is there and that they are super keen on, on um, uh, funding projects of the kind to help them meet their SDGs uh, objectives. Um, we're super lucky that we met uh, Jeremy Flanagan, uh, uh, the head of SOS Cortarrama, uh, this British ornithologist who knows everything about the bird in the locality and who told us about this, this, this forest and, and these wetlands. Um, so partnerships are the way, research, and uh, funding projects on the ground that will be there to ensure that these habitats basically are protected on a local level. Uh, thank you both for those really wonderful responses. <laughs> um, I'll offer um, my thoughts from the Green Wave perspective. Um, I mean, I think there are a number of uh, ways forward here and I think one thing is recognizing the role that farmers have and that these crops are playing to serve restoration goals as well. Um, we're farming, but the farmers have incentive to maintain and keep up these crops and keep them functioning and providing those necessary ecosystem services. Um, but we want to really move forward carefully and sustainably and with respect for the commons in which we're operating. Um, and so ensuring that we're playing that role of providing training and support and helping to promote science and best practices throughout the industry, I think is really important. Um, but also uh, data collection, data collection, data collection and working with our scientific partners. I mean, I can't really say that enough and emphasize it enough. And We've had projects for many years where we're working on um, developing low cost sensors and um, different monitoring techniques for our ocean farms so that we can best kind of account for this and build a network of data so we can understand that regional difference and that farm specific uh, farm level data. So um, we need a lot of folks on our side to help us to execute this. Um, and I think that it is really promising for a way forward. Great, thank you so much and thank you all. And you know, with that final response, it's time for our panel to close. Uh, we're a little over, sorry, but you know, an hour goes so fast when you have three like spectacular panelists with so much great things to say. So, you know, climate change is a heavy topic, but it's been great to learn about some of the impacts in this conference and also about some of the potential solution and the hopeful news on the horizon from these great panelists. 
Um, I hope everyone joining us today is able to take something with them and is ready for the next steps to solve climate change. <laughs> so thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to Claudia and Ryan and the rest of the conference team for doing so much work. And thank you all for joining the Marine Natural Carbon Solutions panel today. Um, so up next is, the is our closing keynote to close out the conference, uh, Kathy Jetnell Kitchener. And the closing keynote will begin at 2.30 p.m. Eastern and the Zoom link will be entered in the chat and it's also available in your registration. Thank you again, have a great day. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone, it's been a pleasure. Cheers.